Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, coming to today's uh, public lecture series. Uh, I want to express our thanks uh, to the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive, and especially to the ins inspirational leadership of Vice Chancellor Shannon Jackson, uh, who has put together this uh, lecture series in collaboration with the art and design program at the University of California at Berkeley. I want to particularly thank the donors uh, that have made this public lecture series possible. And welcome to all of you who are not students in the class. Uh, as members of the public, we really appreciate your presence. My name is Alex Sarawasa, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, guest lecture. Raymond Deus is our lecturer today, uh, who has over 35 years uh, of a career in film and television, including the production of documentaries uh, and news magazine segments. His work has been shown uh, uh, as a producer director for NBC, ABC, PBS, National Geographic, Univision, and the Discovery International um, Channel. His, um, he started his career in many respects uh, as a producer director with KQED right here in the Bay Area. Uh, before that, he was in Los Angeles working for Univision uh, Television. Uh, and since then, he's gone, gone on to uh, a very successful career, both uh, working with network television, but also for independent film productions in which, uh, for which he has been director-producer. Uh, I won't go through all of these um, uh, titles. Uh, I will mention, uh, because they were national broadcast productions, including Inside the Body Trade and 24 Hours on the Border, for National Geographic Explorer, Race is a Place for PBS and Independent Lens, uh, Eye on the Universe for Discovery Network International, uh, and in 2017, uh, his work was nominated in the category of News and Documentary Emmy Award nomination for his uh, production of Dogtown Redemption. Um, he's also been a documentary um, filmmaker. I mentioned, again, only a couple of examples. Uh, for uh, Frontline, he has done Children of the Night uh, and In Search of Law and Order, a three-hour series on juvenile justice for PBS. He has won several awards and accolades for his work, including the DuPont Columbia Gold Baton, a Peabody Award, three Emmy Awards, the Ohio State Award, uh, as well as two awards from the American Latin Media Association. Uh, he has received top honors at the San Francisco, Ameri uh, San Francisco American Film and Video Association and Chicago and New York Film Festivals. He um, received uh, in 2011, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Latino Media Awards Association, um, the Rarified Company. Those of you who have been in the class, Rita Moreno is one of those recipients uh, as well. Uh, he has served as a, a member of the jury for documentaries for the Sundance Film Festival and has been a consultant for the Institute of Latin American Projects. Ray, I'm not going to read all of this, okay? Uh, let me finish by saying that he teaches here at Berkeley. He's an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies uh, and artist in residence at the Center for Latino Policy Research here at the university. He has his MFA from UCLA. Please join me in welcoming Ray Raymond Deus. Um, Alex, thank you for the invitation. And, and, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I, I'm, it's a great honor to be able to speak to you guys and really share a little bit of my work, um, but also to have, engage in a conversation with Alex and, and with you folks. So I'm hoping that this will become a conversation. Um, we're going to show a, a couple of clips. 
um, of a film, the last film that I completed, which is called Pedro y Guerrero, A Photographer's Journey. And it's a film um, that started out as a labor of love. Um, and one of the things that um, I want to be very upfront about is sometimes as a filmmaker, you do things for money, and sometimes you do them out of love. And, um, and uh, you try to bring the same passion to both. So um, there, there's this romantic idea of, of an independent filmmaker, right? That you know, you're going off and you're doing these projects because you love them and you know, you're off to exotic places and everything. But you know, people like me who have a family also have to make a living. And um, Alex and I in, in, were involved in, 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 a, in a film called The Storm That Swept Mexico that was on the air on PBS a few years ago. And that film was 10 years in the making. So um, if I had spent all of my time and all of my energy working on that one film, I would have starved, my children would have starved, and my wife would have left me. So, you know, it's that kind of thing. So we, independent filmmakers, go back and forth, um, making, developing the films and raising money for, for our passion projects, but we also do work for networks. And that's why I ended up doing three films for, for uh, for uh, Discovery and National Geographic, because you have to have this balance. Pedro y Guerrero, a photographer's journey, started out as, as, a, as, as a labor of love because I'd known Pedro for many years and I thought he had a wonderful story. Okay. And we shot a, an interview with Pedro at his home in Florence, Arizona, over the period of three days when he was 93 years of age. So you'll see him. When you see him here, he's 93. And I, I just hope I'm as sharp as, and, and as good looking as he is at 93. He's, he, it's, it's unbelievable. And so what happened with Pedro is that we, we, would, we would talk for an hour and a half or two. Then he'd go and take a nap. We'd talk again. And we'd go eat. And that's how it happened. We didn't know where the film was going to go. But basically, we tried to capture the what, a conversation on camera that we'd had many times before. So that was the genesis of this project. That conversation happened in 2010, and he died in 2012. Um, at that point, we decided, let's do something with it. We, my, my son, David, cut a, a clip for a memorial, for his memorial, five minutes, and we, we took it to, um, to Latino Public Broadcasting, which is, a, is, is, is one of the funders of this film. Uh, they fund independent uh, projects through tax, taxpayer dollars at work. Um, and we, we got some money to, to basically do a first cut of the film. Uh, and from there, we were able to raise money uh, from the Corporation for Public, Broadcast, Public Broadcasting because of the inter interest of a, uh, a series called American Masters. Is, do, are, you, are you folks familiar with American Masters? Any of you? Okay. So American Masters, for those of you who do not know, is basically the premier series on the arts in the US. It's the only series on the arts uh, on PBS. Um, and I don't know if any of the other channels have them, but basically, if you, want to, if you want to see uh, an ongoing series, you want to see artists and their stories, that's where you go. So we got American Masters interested in, in the film, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and some other funders who you'll see here uh, put money into it. But it wasn't an easy job. Okay, one of the things is, uh, as, as a filmmaker, is that you, ha you spend more time raising money than you do making the film. Okay, so... Uh, we, were, we, were, we were thrilled that we got this film on American Masters. Uh, it got a national broadcast in 2015. And um, just for your information, and this is a little pitch for American Masters, you can see this film online. You can go online right now and see the film. Check out the American Masters website because it has wonderful stories of no, not, not just American artists now, but where they're looking at sports figures and other cultural figures, uh, American cultural figures, and you can see the film in its entirety and also clips. And there are articles on their website that, that illuminate and kind of give you 
kind of behind the scenes look as, as to the making of the film and more about the artist. So I urge you to go on the website and, and check out some of the arts artists that they, that they profile and, and dig into the, um, dig into the, into the stories. They have a very robust website. So uh, we were, we were thrilled uh, at the fact that we got this project on the air, uh, on this series. And we come to realize that this was the first uh, Latino, U.S. Latino artist to ever get on American Masters. Okay? Rita Moreno has still not been on American Masters. Okay? Um, they had done Diego Rivera, uh, Jose Clemente Orozco, but they were Mexicans, other artists. But Pedro was one of these. What, what was the first one? U.S. Latino, Mexican American, or other Latino. None of them had been on there. So um, this for us was, was, was a milestone. And the other thing that, was, that, was, that I'd like to point out is that uh, for those of you who may follow the arts, um, Pedro captured the work and also the personalities in a documentary fashion of three of the most important American artists of the 20th century. The architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, the sculptor, Alexander, uh, and, and mobile maker, Alexander Calder, and the sculptor, Louise Nevelson. Um, I have to tell you that Pedro lived a charmed life. His life spans pretty much the 20th century. He's a man who was born in Arizona uh, into a family that goes back generations, goes back actually to before Arizona was Arizona, when it was still Mexico. And his, his, like many families, they would cross back and forth across what was not a border there, necessarily, uh, to Sonora and back. Okay. So he, in many ways, he, his story is, is a, a little bit of an unusual, but it's the story of many people who lived on the border, who have lived on the border for many, many years, along the Texas, Arizona, California border. Okay. So, um, this is, this is the story of a man, but it's also of a man who basically took the work of these three ma major American artists and, 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 and interpreted, showed us who he was. Besides being an architectural photographer, uh, what was unique about his, his career, I think, is the fact that he got to know the artists and was able to do, to do some behind the scenes work with them. And, and that you get to know who Alexander Calder is, and we find that we find out that actually Frank Lloyd Wright had a sense of humor. Most people don't know that. So anyway, so um, I, I, I guess we can we can go ahead and, and show the first clip. The first clip is an introduction. Uh, it, it has the, the opening titles, uh, so you get a sense of who, who's who's putting the money into this into this film. Uh, it's it's uh, there are a couple of, of actual Latino organizations that we got behind this film. Uh, the Castellano Foundation is actually a, a, a local foundation. The Castellano Family Foundation put money into this film, and uh, I think this is the first time they ever funded a film. And there's another organization called NALAC, National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures. Both of those are Latino uh, organizations that are small funders, but they put money in at a very critical time. And the third one was uh, Latino Public Broadcasting, which was actually a co-producer with American Masters of, of this of this. Uh, Particular film, so I, I'd like to perhaps we can, we can roll. You can see a, a clip that introduces his work, and then we'll come back for a few minutes, and I'll introduce the second clip. Thank you. The special presentation of American Masters and Vosis, Pedro E. Guerrero, A Photographer's Journey, has been provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the National Endowment for the Arts, Artworks. Additional funding for American Masters provided by Rosalind P. Walton, the Philip and Janice Levin Foundation.
Judith and Burton Resnick, the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation, Vital Projects Fund, Michael and Helen Schaefer Foundation, the Andre and Elizabeth Cortez Foundation. Additional support for VOSIS provided by the National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures. Additional funding for this program provided by Berkeley Film Foundation, Castellano Family Foundation, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, Mike and Ginny Lester, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. I don't think there's any one photographer who's more closely associated with Frank Lloyd Wright's work than Guerrero. First job I had was with the world's greatest architect. I showed up and he said to me when he saw me, who are you? And I said, my name is Pedro Guerrero and I'm a photographer. I had never introduced myself like that before. He said, would you like to work for us? And, and I said, as you can see, I don't know anything about architecture. And he said, I'll teach you. He said, you can start right now if you want to. Guerrero instantly ingratiated himself by telling him quite honestly that he looked on Wright's architecture as sculpture. And this is, of course, something irresistible to an architect who saw himself above all as an artist. Guerrero had a real natural gift. I mean, how else could a 22-year-old start taking perhaps the most telling photographs that have ever been done of Wright's architecture? The minute I developed my first roll of film and made my first print, I thought, this is mine, this is for me. It was a magic that I could control, and I still feel that way. I'm still amazed what could happen with just a click of a shutter. And then you take it into a dark room and you develop it, and there it is, exactly as you had visualized it. I'm 92. I'm of Mexican descent, still brown, and have had a fantastically glorious life, and it continues to be that way. is always flat, whereas a building is always three-dimensional. To get the three-dimensionality into a two-dimensional surface requires a special understanding of how the camera and the film will work. He had this. It was immediately apparent in looking at his photographs that he had this ability. I think it was intuitive. He could see something and know how to photograph it. When I quit Art Center, Dad saw me skulking around, not knowing what I was going to do with my photography. He said to me one day, why don't you go up to the mountains? There's a guy named Frank Lloyd Wright who's got a school, and he might need a photographer. The first day I saw him, I was in awe of him. He was wearing his pork pie hat. That was to be real class. He's out in the desert. Everybody else is half naked, you know, but he is Mr. Wright. He said, would you like to work for us? You can start right now if you want to. 
But I told him that I didn't have my camera. And he said, I have a camera that takes good pictures. It was a five by seven camera. It didn't have a, a, a shutter. It just had a lens and a lens cap. And he used it when, when film was so slow, he could take the cap off and go and get a drink of water and put it back on. It was the embrace of friendship, which was freely given, the confidence in him and his work extended to him by right. And, and these two things gave him, shall we say, the emotional support that a young man at that time was in need of. I heard somebody ask him, what kind of pencil do you use, Mr. Wright? And he said, my dear boy, it's not the pencil, it's the man. So when he came over and says, how come you're not using my camera? It takes good pictures. I said, Mr. Wright, it's not the camera, it's the man. This is the kind of relationship we had. He just laughed and walked away. It was a strong father-son relationship, much more so than even a, a mentor-protege relationship. One of the important reasons, I think, for that is that he came along in Wright's life at a very crucial point. By the end of the 1930s, he was at a peak of international renown and... Okay, so there you have a, a sense of the relationship, how he got started in the relationship he had with Frank Lloyd Wright. He went on to have a very similar relationship with Al Alexander Calder. Um, so I wanted to show you a, a second clip. And the second clip gives you some background into his family and where he came from. Okay, so um, Pedro was born into a Mexican-American family, an American citizen, okay? Um, father was an American citizen. Yet in that period, uh, there was still a tremendous amount of, of, of discrimination. This was the turn of the century. I think Pedro was born around 1914, 15. I haven't done the math recently. Uh, and at that time, in California, in, in Texas, in Arizona, if you were Mexican-American, uh, particularly if you were living in the smaller towns, you went to the Mexican schools, okay? So uh, our, 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 our California Supreme Court, court uh, Justice, whose name uh, escapes me, uh, Mexican-American, uh, Cruz Reynoso, for example, uh, was raised in Southern California and Orange County. They had Mexican schools there. So Pedro and his brother and his sisters uh, would be shipped across town to these Mexican, uh, these Mexican schools. Mesa, Arizona was a, 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 was a town which, in which there were settlers from all over the, all over the country, but primarily uh, Mormon settlers uh, came down from Utah settled in that area. And at that time, uh, there was still a lot of uh, discrimination. People were sent off to these Mexican sc schools, but also, if you were going to uh, begin a business, as his father did, his father was an entrepreneur, if you were going to begin a business and you were Mexican-American, you had to have uh, someone who was not Mexican-American, an Anglo-American co-sign. Uh, so here you have a family who despite many, many di different obstacles, uh, is able to, to move ahead. And actually, his father uh, did very well in, in a period during the Depression uh, by starting a company uh, painting signs. So that's where, um, just to give you a little background, that's where Frank Lloyd Wright and Pedro's father met. Okay, so there's different stories. One, one story is that Pedro, Senior, Pedro W. Guerrero, and Frank Lloyd Wright met while they were buying paint. And the other story was, and it's not in the film, that they met because they both liked green chile at a particular place, and they would end up at the same restaurant and they got to know each other. So when he goes off and Pedro says, you got to go see that guy Frank Lloyd Wright, he may need, he may need a photographer. His father's already pushing him to go up, up the hill and, 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 get, and get a job. So this next clip um, will give you a sense of what it, the, the background that he comes from and also some of the obstacles that, that he was facing. Can you go ahead and roll?
He spoke the language of Frank Lloyd Wright, as you feel when you look at his, his photographs. There, there, there's no conflict there. I think absolutely that Guerrero's Arizona background was crucial to his early photographic success with Wright. As a young Mexican boy living in Mesa, it didn't make any difference whether you knew how to speak English or where you were born. And Adolfo and I went to a school that was just for Mexicans, even though we spoke English already. But they, this was part of the underlying uh, prejudice. And I think, in a way, we were stigmatized, you might say, because Dad was a successful businessman. He was a Rotarian, and he would drive us to school sometime where everybody else had to walk. And we had, it wasn't the finest home in the world, it was pretty goddamn good. So it, it was a rare family moving upwards. I was driving from my dad's shop on my bicycle and the Main Street of Mesa at that time was only two lanes and the car was coming, so I got off the road and I hit a rut and I wobbled a little bit as this car went by and I recognized him as being my new homeroom teacher and I waited. No response. When school started, we all sat down and he said, uh, I want everybody to stand up and introduce themselves, tell me what your name is and I won't forget it. Then I got up and he said, you know, if I hadn't been such a good driver, there would be one less Mexican in this town. This was my homeroom teacher. This was my hello, welcome. Oh God, that was a miserable year. And that was the beginning of the time that I thought I got to leave this town. I have to go someplace where I can be accepted for what I do, not for what I am. And I lived in Mesa until my 20th birthday. On my 20th birthday, I decided that I'd lived at home long enough. The reason I went to our school is because of my brother Adolfo, he was there. I didn't have really the talent that he did. I thought that maybe I could develop some kind of a craft. And I had been there, and I'd been lucky enough to walk into a class where there was a naked woman just standing there. And I said, who would want to go to that school? The art courses were filled, and I said, is there anything else? And they said, well, we teach photography, and they were kind of stunned to have me accept that as an alternative, which I did. I mean, if there had been diesel engineering, I would have taken diesel engineering, but it was photography, and it was a marvelous coincidence. All I wanted to do is, I'd come upon a subject that I liked, and I just stabbed it. And I knew that there was something between the camera lens the shutter at my head. And that's guided me ever since. He always was ambitious. Pedro always wanted to make a name for himself. I think he always had a sense that, that something big was going to happen to him. December 7th, 1941, a day of infamy. Even, Japanese... Even before Pearl Harbor, Pete enlisted. And most men enlisted after Pearl Harbor when there was just a call to duty and a patriotism. But, but Pete, Pete enlisted in September, and then he went to tell Frank Lloyd Wright. He was a notorious pacifist. And I believed him, and I still believe. There's no good wars. He used to tell us, when you're called, the don't go. You can always count on having a, a place here, Talius. So I wrote Dad and told him that I was registered, but I was not going to go. Dad, he said, you know, this is your obligation. It's this obligation to your ethnic background and to the family. And by the time it, it got around, to my enlisting, I realized that, that he was right and that he had not ever advised me uh, selfishly. 
he uh, he really thought that maybe I would never be able to overcome the fact that I shirked my duty as a citizen. Wright understood particularly Pete's and Pete's father's feeling that as Mexican-Americans, they needed to show their loyalty to the United States. And Wright reached into his pocket and produced a large wad of bills and peeled off $200 bills and gave them to Pete, a considerable amount of money in 1941, and um, told him he was welcome back at any time. For those of you who have not been uh, our guests before, I usually have a conversation with our guests for a bit, uh, and then we open it up for Q&A, and I hope you, you won't be shy about asking questions uh, of, of Ray Gaius. Um, Ray, maybe we could um, say a bit about the rest of the film. He goes into the military. Um, tell us a bit about what happens between that moment in his life and in a sense, coming back to his career as a photographer. Okay, um, so Pedro or Pete, he went by different names depending on where he was in his life, because he was he was searching for his identity. Mm -hmm. as, and I think during that era, and I, I know my generation is kind of like you know, you have ambivalent feelings about being Mexican or Mexican American. So he uh, basically at one point called himself Pete. Peter, Pedro, and, and you know, finally at 70, I think is when he kind of figured out, well, I, I feel pretty good in my skin. <laughs> and then he went by Pedro Guerrero. So what happens is he goes into the, into the service and he is stationed in, in Italy. And they're basically what's happening is that they, they, they have uh, photographers uh, on these bombers, on these bombing mills. So where a gunner would sit, a photographer would sit, and they would take they would take photographs of him as, as, as bombers are flying over. So he was in, he was not in the bombers, but he was back at, you know, out, out of the way, out of the line of fire, uh, developing the photographs. And so he spent his time mostly in Italy, but he got a chance to travel around France, Italy, all over the place, and did a lot of photography there. Uh, and and some beautiful in the film we have some beautiful photographs of that. Era. Then he returns. Um, he married a, a woman from Art Center. Dixie in here is his second wife. Mm -hmm. So the wife died in the 70s. And he, he goes to New York. Uh, and basically, he wants to start a career as a photographer. But he has no idea of how to do it. He says, like, I, I was lost. So I started going around to the different magazines and different outfits. And all I had was photographs of Frank Lloyd Wright. And so they were impressed, uh, and they hired him because he didn't have a portfolio. It was mm -hmm. Frank Lloyd Wright's photographs. So then he spent the next 20, 25 years uh, working for the major uh, magazines, uh, what they call them shelter magazines, Condé Nast. So all the major magazines hired him to do these assignments on architecture, on sculpture, mostly architecture. So he would go photographing buildings, interiors, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. And um, in the meantime, he would run off and work with, with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. So he worked with Frank Lloyd Wright from 39 until 41, I guess, when, when the war broke out, uh, before the war broke out. And then after the war, he did the commercial phot photography, but he would do projects with, with Wright. And he continued to work with Wright until Wright's death. Uh, in 1959, I believe it was. It's been about 25 years ago. And Frank Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright was like a father figure to him. They were very, very close. He adored his own father, but I think he almost had like two fathers. Mm -hmm. And so when Wright died, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. And through an assignment for House and Garden, um, he went and, and, and met Alexander Calder. And he shows up at Alexander Calder's house, and he looks around, and he says, there's absolutely nothing that the magazine is going to want here. There's nothing that 
to get your merchandise. I mean, basically, a magazine makes its money by advertising refrigerators and stoves or whatever. And Frank Lloyd Wright lived in this house that was painted black. He made all his own utensils. He had an old wood stove. And he basically said, oh, well. And so, so that assignment went out the window, but he asked Wright to keep the photograph. And so a relationship started with, with the college student that lasted nearly 20 years. Okay. Uh, and in the film, we show that relationship. We show uh, basically the, the work that he did, which was really, really remarkable, because not only did he, did he photograph uh, Calder's work, but he showed the process, how Calder worked. Because some of Calder's pieces, I, if any of you are familiar with them, they're huge. They're huge pieces. Some of them are very small, little intimate pieces, but some of them are huge, and they require skilled craftsmen to produce them. And we see the behind the scenes work. You see, it, you see the scale of, 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 the, of the different sculptures. You also see the relationship of the different, different sculptures. And then what happened is that he continued with, 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 uh, with Calder until Calder's death. Mm -hmm. So he actually ended up photographing right like a week before he died, Calder two days before he died. And then he ended up with Louise Nevelson, the sculptor in New York, uh, and followed her right up, right up until her death. Um, in the meantime, uh, he had moved to to New Canaan, Connecticut, which uh, basically uh, is some of the great modernist homes uh, are there in, this, in two locations, in New Canaan, Connecticut, and Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We have some of the, the great modernist homes and photographed a lot, continued to photograph for the magazines, but he did a lot of work on his own on, on, on modernist architecture. And then what happened is that he served on, he was on the draft board in New Canaan, Connecticut. And this was during the Vietnam War. And there was an article that came out on the front page of the New, New York Times basically saying is that Pedro Guerrero was on this draft board and they were giving out too many uh, presenters, mm -hmm. deferments. Mm -hmm. And the publisher of one of the Condé Nast publishers, one of the big guys, basically said, Pedro Guerrero is never to ever do another assignment for us. Basically, he disagreed with the response. And after 20 some odd years of working for these major magazines, he's blackballed. And so that his income pretty much stopped. But it was a turning point for him because he then dedicated, because he had nothing else to do for one thing, and because of his passion, he dedicated himself to these more personal projects with Calder and Nevelson mm -hmm. and uh, primarily. I mean, basically, it was, it, was, it was an opportunity for him to, to basically dedicate himself to the passion. I'm, da I'm dating myself um, because most of these magazines that I'm aware of no, no longer exist. But his work appeared in, at that time, mainstream publications like Look, Life Magazine, and other uh, sort of things. So he really got around and, and was very well known in those circles. Right. No, he was very well known as a commercial photographer, as an architectural photographer. But he was not known for the, 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 the fine art mm -hmm. photography, for the work that he was doing with Calder and, and Wright and with Nevelson. And mm -hmm. what happened is that people had seen the photographs. People, many people were familiar with the photographs, but they never knew the photographer. And when we went to American Masters mm -hmm. to pitch them, they, they saw the photographs. So we know this, we knew, they knew the photographs. But then they asked me this weird question. It was like, well, why didn't, why don't we know about him? And I looked at him and I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> now you do. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, you know, if, if, you know, I don't want to be, put anybody down, but because the attitude was like, of course we know all the major artists, yeah. you know, here in New York and, and, and here at American Masters. So it was a discovery for them. Mm -hmm. So they were able to basically match the artist with the work. Uh, so they, they, you know, they're, it, it, if you look through the work that's been done on Frank Lloyd Wright, you will recognize many of Pedro's uh, photographs. Mm -hmm. Not only of the work, but of, of Wright himself. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of photographs. There's one um, very famous photograph, and we have a, a series. I mean, we, we were really lucky in that, in that Pedro not only allowed us to use his photographs, 
and this is very unusual for photography. For photography. He allowed us to use his proof sheets and his negatives. So in this film, you see photographs that have never been seen before. Mm -hmm. So he was generous in that way, and he was also modest in that way. So we have a series of images, uh, six or seven images that we pan across that were, when the photographer shoots, he don't shoot, doesn't shoot just one, he shoots a, a series, practice the photos. It's a series of images of him sitting and contemplating the, 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 the completion of the Guggenheim Museum, mm -hmm. which is a great, great work of his. And basically they stopped on the final image that, uh, that is published, where he's sitting there in reverie, staring at this building, sipping a cup of tea. So those are the photographs that people know. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the other photographs, the behind the scenes photographs, mm -hmm. the construction of, of Taliesin West, uh, the work that he did, not only of the, of, of the buildings themselves, mm -hmm. but when they were constructing Taliesin West, um, they were, he captured the construction, the, the workers, mm -hmm. the apprentices putting it together. Uh, and that was, you know, social realism, you know, which was big in, in the late 1930s and early 40s. Mm -hmm. So he kind of, he, he was, he was in on all those trends. Those yes. Trends. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. If, if I may. Uh, so he's in Connecticut. So how in the heck does he end up back in Arizona? <laughs> well, he's, that, that's he, a big jump. Yeah. Well, what happened? It took him it took him a good part of his life. Mm -hmm. you know, so he left mm -hmm. left for Art Center mm -hmm. in, uh, at twenty. Mm -hmm. He went into the service what at twenty two, twenty three. Went with gone in, uh, to war for a couple of years. Then settled and raised a family in, in Connecticut and made his career in New York. And then um, his kids grew up, and he, he, he grew up in a way. He, he, he had, I think, a very conflicted idea, uh, a conflicted life. And he, he was conflicted about being a Mexican, a Mexican-American. He, he, he was very conflicted about that. He had a rough time. I think rougher than any of his siblings in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I think he kind of grew into it, kind of figured out who he was. And at the age of like 70, 72, he said, I'm, I'm going to go back. And he went back to this little town of, called Florence, Arizona. I don't know if you guys know where it is, but it's halfway between Phoenix and Tucson, and it's best known because of its prisons. There's like a federal, couple, a federal prison there, a state prison. I don't know, there are like five or six prisons in, in Florence. And they, that was a little town where his great-grandparents had gotten married. Mm -hmm. And where when he was a kid, his father would send him out uh, to deliver signs. Mm -hmm. And he finally felt comfortable enough to go back. And he spent the last 20 years of his life in this little town in Florence, still working, and, and, and basically spending time with his siblings that he basically had had little to do with for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So it was his coming home. Mm -hmm. It was coming mm -hmm. home. He made a big circle there. Well, talking about artistic journeys and so on, I wonder if you would be willing to share with us your own artistic journey. How did the kid from your background end up becoming a documentary filmmaker? Um, I didn't read all of the accolades that he received and so on. That's a pretty big jump. It's not like you grew up with a father who was a famous artist and a mother who was uh, a rival to Frida Kahlo or anything like that. Well, my story is not as interesting as Pedro's. Well, but, 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 but why don't you let us okay. make that mistake? No, but he, <laughs> he did some, some trem very tremendous work. And I just want to point out that he, his life was, he, was a, he led a charmed life. And the fact that he knew and had worked with these three major American artists was what made our film possible. Because basically what happens is, when American masters took a look at this, they recognized his work. Mm -hmm. But his work in the context of the three American artists, they knew who these artists were. They'd done shows on all three of them. Mm -hmm. okay. so, that, so in terms of just getting a film produced, that was key. That, that was key. And it's key also you know, when, when, when you're doing films that somehow timing is, is important, uh, context is important, uh, and quality is important. In my case, you know, 
I grew up in Southern California, a, a, a parent, a Mexican American parent. My mother from Mexico, mm -hmm. Mexico. My father from El Paso, and moved to Los Angeles when he was two in 1920. And uh, I was born in East LA, uh, very, very, very large family. And we moved out to the out to the suburbs of Pentry, the name of the suburbs. <laughs> and I ended up growing up uh, basically surrounded with my parents and my grandparents. Very, very, very intimate circle. Uh, went to went went to Catholic school, uh, uh, and basically went to Catholic school because my parents were so Catholic that the, basically at that time they, they told me, "You don't send your kids, kids to Catholic school, then you commit sin." I, I don't know if that's about you guys, but that yeah, that, yeah. that was the, that, that was the kind of the yeah, thinking. Catholic that. nuns and priests had a ability to do that. <laughs> well, that was yeah, and also the 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 Archdiocese of Los Angeles was expanding. They wanted to. Enroll kids in Catholic school, and also the, the, the public school nearby mm -hmm. was just bad. Mm -hmm. So, so actually, I got really lucky in going to public school. Was a good, was a good thing. A charm? Uh, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, charm. I had, I had a lovely, lovely family, and yeah. but I had no idea. I mean, I, I, my parents wanted me to go to college. I was the first one to go to college, and but I had no idea really what I wanted to do, and I ended up because of a, a wonderful high school teacher. Uh, Going into, the, into literature, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be an artist. But I couldn't. I couldn't draw. I couldn't play a musical instrument. I couldn't sing. I didn't know what to do. So I kind of went along the path of literature. And, and uh, I was English major and Spanish minor. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went along at my merry way. But what happened is, uh, a, a few years after I got out of college. I'd been working in, 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 in education. Mm -hmm. I came across some of my friends who were making films. And by then, I'd moved up here to the Bay Area. And um, they were having a lot of fun making films. And I said, boy, this is something I could do. So I, I volunteered at a cable TV station to learn kind of the, the technical aspects. And uh, I worked on projects with my, uh, with my buddies. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn film. And I found that, that that was something that I could do. It was. It, it was. It, it, I wanted to also wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to teach, and I had do, done some teaching. And so this was an opportunity for me to use a medium to teach, and it also it dovetailed with my interest in the social change and politics. And so this is a, this was a way that you could communicate with people uh, through through a visual medium, mm -hmm. and that's. That all, that, that's, that's how that, that evolved. And so I ended up in a situation where I had to make a choice. Am I going to continue the direction I'm going, I'm going or am I going to go into what I, my passion, which is film? And so I, I, I set myself up and basically applied to three film schools and I got into UCLA, into an MFA program at UCLA. And then everything changed. There. And it was one of these situations where I needed to get into a program which was very, very intensive. UCLA basically provided that. Mm -hmm. You eat, sleep, drink, that's all you do for, 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 for a couple of years. Then you get out of an MFA program and you start at the bottom. And that's, that's what, what happened with me. I ended up uh, uh, basically working for, for Jack Webb. I don't know if anybody here has heard of Jack Webb. He did a show <laughs> called Dragnet. Mark Seven Productions, and I was a production assistant there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I Xerox copies and takes drive scripts for writers and that kind of stuff. And eventually, uh, after a year or so, got a job at Kennedy Sun, which was like then mm -hmm. was then Spanish International Network mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and I, and and I started working there for a couple of years. But the discovery of that passion, that turn, was when you came up here and you ran into some friends who were doing film. Is that? Kind of like the key turn. The key turn was that, that in awakening that passion to become a filmmaker. Right, it awakened a passion, but it was also something that I, I could actually do. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't draw, <laughs> but this is something that I could actually do. Mm -hmm. It was something that you did with your hands mm -hmm. and with your mind, and that w that just opened the world mm -hmm. to me. That's what I wanted to do. That's mm -hmm. what I, I knew that's what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and that's what's been the driving force of the film. This may be an intimate question for you, but. Uh, you know, I've seen many of your works, and I, I just 
who I was pondering recently uh, as I thought about introducing you today, etc. What it feels like uh, for someone like yourself who's worked in the bottom and uh, you finally get to see your work, in a sense, uh, in the big screen. That is, uh, your, a, a television production. And you're sitting there and you say to yourself, what, what the heck? What does that feel like? And when did that happen to you? What was that work that just uh, that, uh, generated that, that emotion, that feeling, which I assume you have in seeing your work being broadcast? Well, I have to tell you, seeing, being in this room, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the best place to watch Film, let me tell you. <laughs> this is this is probably one of the finest rooms in the country, and the screen is beautiful. So, what mm -hmm. I, and usually I, I I see my my work is seen on a small screen, mm -hmm. but when I was able to see Feather up there on this big screen uh, off a of Blu-ray, mm -hmm. I go, oh boy, this looks really cool. This is the way you want it to, to look because on TV it doesn't look the same. But what happened is when I was working with um, with uh, Univision, I was a it started out kind of like as a, as a production assistant and a cameraman, and we'd see, we'd see some projects on some of my work on TV, which was cool, which was fun. Uh, and then uh, I came up to K3ED. I got, I was, I, I, my timing was, I had really good timing, really good luck. I was able to get go to K3ED and start working there at, at a time when K3ED was going through tra transition. They had a, a, a show that lasted for many years. Some of you from the Bay Area may be familiar with it. It was Newsroom mm -hmm. that died. They killed it <laughs> around 1979, 1980. And from there evolved a, a, uh, a current affairs department. Mm -hmm. We did a show called Express, which was weekly shows. And watching and being able to see your, 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 your work um, on TV and, and your family sees it on TV, even if it might be a two minute, three minute story, was really was really exciting, it was really cool. And I had started out thinking that I wanted to be a narrative filmmaker, make feature films. And I kind of fell into documentary filmmaking. And then I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And making a narrative film is amazing, it's wonderful, but it's it, it's it's the projects are huge. Mm -hmm. And in the world of documentary you, you, you especially working for an outfit like K three D, you had to get work on the air every week. So I had pieces on. I said, this is really exciting. Mm -hmm. But when I did my first independent film, which is a film called Santeros, which I had, I was at KQD for 10 years, but I took, I, I would work on these other independent projects at the same time. When I, 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 I finished Santeros, you know, we actually got into a couple of festivals and got it on, on PBS. That for me was like, this is really my project. Mm -hmm. I collaborated with, with my friends. But this is something that I did. In, in a way that I wanted to do it, um, and that for me was 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 a wonderful moment, a really really wonderful moment. So, my mom and dad saw it. Oh, mom and dad saw it. And my uncles and my aunts and they're like they called everybody. Hey. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that same feeling I I I get when I got with, with this film, mm -hmm. because I, I'm to be honest. One of the reasons I ended up doing this film is because I married into the Guerrero family. Okay, my wife is uh, Pedro's niece, and Rodolfo, the brother, is my father-in-law. He passed away since, so I had access. So I got the same feeling uh, when I went back when, when we did screenings before the um, before the show was broadcast. We mm -hmm. did screenings all over the place, and we did a screening in, at the Mesa Cultural Center. And when they showed this film with all the family there, oh, in a big screen, with a very friendly audience, I had that same feeling mm -hmm. same, as I had when my first film was shown you know, 40, 40 years ago. Like, oh, I come home, I'm showing it to my, I'm showing it to my family. Mm -hmm. My parents were gone, but that family was still there. And, it, and, it, and, and there's something important about showing your work to your family. I, I, I still seek approval from my family. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't like it, then there's something wrong. <laughs> Great moment. All right, let's open it up for Q&A. Any comments anyone would like to make? Any questions? This is your opportunity. Uh, I w please urge you, welcome you to 
make a comment or ask a question, raise Any, your hand, and we'll bring the microphone to anything's you. Anything's fair. Yeah. A anything is fair uh, in that regard. Okay, we have someone here in the front. Right there, I see. Yeah. Did you raise your hand up higher? No, but we're, this is being taped. This is being taped. It'll be on television and so on. And, uh, you know, who knows? Pixar might might uh, pick up on your question in such a way that they'll make a movie about it. Go ahead. Um, I'm just curious, how was it to work with Jack Webb in, in the Hollywood situation? I'm sure that's kind of an interesting thing. He's like worth a million. And well, I, I worked, I've worked in L.A. on another, another project. But at that time, I, I had a professor called by the name of Frank Lauderette. And he's the one that guided me. And he basically... He says, I've got a job for you. And he was hired on as a, he was a friend of Jack Webb. And what I remember about Jack Webb, he's a very nice man, but he wore these tablecloth patterned shirts. I don't know, you know, like white and red checks. So one day it'd be white and red checks, another day it'd be white and green checks, another day it'd be white and blue checks, <laughs> and then you recycle them again. <laughs> and, and, the, and the same gray slacks and the same loafers. And that's what I remember. He was a, he was a very, very nice, very smart man. But at that time, Mark Seven production was taken up and taken off, and they were doing, uh, you know, uh, emergency. They were doing firefighter dogs and that kind of stuff. He was a perfectly nice man, but you know, I was his underling, and he would say, "Well, my car's kind of dirty. Will you take it to the car wash?" <laughs> perfectly nice guy. I was the gopher. And here's a guy. You know, I had already had real had real jobs. I had an MFA, but at that point. What you do? What I found out is you don't tell anybody in the industry that you went to UCLA and got an MFA because they laugh at you. Mm. you know, they're not going to take you seriously. So I learned to keep my mouth shut because if you tell that to somebody who's been working for 20 or 30 years at, in whatever capacity, they're going to say, well, "Who are you?" <laughs> so you have to show you have to pr prove your stuff. He, he's, he, he was a very very nice guy, and I, my my my. But I wanted to get out of it really fast. And my opportunities actually came at Univision uh, because it was growing. And I had some skills. And, and I actually moved up very quickly because they needed people who had skills. And um, I ended up working with a very interesting guy, a foreign interesting guy by the name of Danny Villanueva. And Danny Villanueva had been a place kicker, punter for the LA Rams. Mexican-American, spoke English and, and Spanish, and he had headed up, he was a GM there, mm -hmm. uh, and went up onto to a very illustrious career, career within Univision, and uh, he, he kind of gave me a bad time, he took me under his wing. Mm -hmm. and basically, I was able to learn a lot and move up, uh, thumbs up, uh, <laughs> uh, at Univision, and, and, and eventually, because of working for them, I was able to move back up to the Bay Area where I lived before. And ended up at this movie. Any other questions? My goodness. Yes, sir. Don't be shy. Back to the, uh, the documentary. Uh, can you say something more about the uh, Mormon business community in Mesa? The morning, more what? Mormon business community in Mesa. The, were they set up normally so that they would try to hold control over the uh, business yeah. community in a way that would prevent local people from being able to No, no I'll tell you, my, my, my wife grew up in, 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 uh, in Mesa. Basically, outside of, I think, after Salt Lake City, I think it's one of the, big, the biggest wars in, in, in the country. It was a Mormon town. It was a Mormon settler town. Mm -hmm. And the folks that she went to school with, I know a lot of them. I think Mormons are among some of the nicest people I've ever met, really. Very, very, very nice folk. But the way that, that the, the situation was, was set up in Mesa is that and in Arizona, I, I guess in general, is uh, Pedro Guerrero could not get a business off the ground unless he uh, went into partnership with an Anglo. And, 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 and this is Mormon town, so. Daniels were the Mormons, and, um, but he, you know, it was it was it was it was a good relationship for the most part. 
But basically, that was the reality. If you could not, as a Mexican, a Mexican American, go into business, start a business. So actually, the first company that that we started is called Guerrero Lindsay, Guerrero Lindsay Sign Company, which is a, which which is a company that still exists, barely. <laughs> but it was set up with a person by the last name of Lindsay, and that company was set up so that um, if there was ever a family member that needed a job, they, they could go there. But Pedro started his started out. Um, he was born in Arizona, and because of histor several historical events, he was sent back to Sonora to live with his grandmother, the family, and, and, and he lived in Sonora and basically ran away from his grandmother at 13 or 14 years of age and walked back to Mesa, and along the, along the way, ended up making his way by painting signs, and that's where he made his career. So Guerrero Lindsay Sign Company uh, was kind of the, the first company, and then he went on, on to find. And this is a person who had like a third grade education. He went on to find a uh, start a company called Rosarita Foods, and Rosa, Rosada was his wife. The image on the original can of beans was his daughter Mary, and and my father-in-law Adolfo painted the painted, did the drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and they started out selling tamales locally, and it turned into this this this, this, uh, this larger company, which, because of the partnership he got involved with in that, sort of led to the demise of the company. Mm -hmm. he, got, he was a businessman who was entrepreneurial, but really didn't have the experience of running a company. Mm -hmm. So he grew into a large company and less than. Matt, um, I just wanted to ask more about what it was like like filming the, the documentary, just more about like what goes on like behind the court and stuff like that. Okay, so um, we started with this interview. And basically, it was one of these situations where. We 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 talked about making films. Pedro and I talked about making films on right and call them uh, over a period of years. And uh, you know, other people made films on right and call them. And so finally, we decided. We got actually my son and a couple of my buddies and I. We decided let's go do this interview with Pedro. Shot it on a red. We all had to act My my job was basically kind of senior producer and and, and correspond, kind of guiding them and. All young, young, very talented filmmakers. So we had this, 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 this interview, and I strung it together, uh, and that was where we were able to get some money because we could see what we had. So uh, basically, did an assembly, string together with some images to show what we had, and that's when we went to to LPB, to Public Broadcasting. They needed a show. It was very, it was, here was timing. They need the, the executive producers needed a show done that year, so they ended up putting two hundred thousand dollars into that, and so we got a very good cut done, you know, very good rough cut done. Excuse me, um, and then we could go to American Masters. Now. So the decisions we had to make was like, well, what, how, how do how do we structure this? What other voices do we need? So we basically decided that the voices that we would we would need we would use were people who knew Pedro and his work and also knew the artist. So, um, for example, Joan Martyr was an expert on Calder, did a lot about Calder, knew him very well, spent a lot of time with him, did a dissertation on him, knew him for many years, also knew Pedro, knew Pedro's work. And with um, Louise Nevelson, uh, her granddaughter, was very familiar with the work, and knew Pedro. She comes on, on on camera, and then we saw this woman, this gentleman, Martin Filler. Um, he knew Pedro for many years, and basically edited a lot of his work and knew all of the artists. And then we had Catherine Smith, who knew uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and a couple other folks who knew Frank Lloyd Wright and also knew Pedro. So there was a connection. So they knew 
the, the, the work of the, the, the three big artists, but also that he also knew how Pedro worked with them and the relationship he had. So those are the decisions we had to make in terms of making uh, who, who we're going to interview. Then we did this interview with Pedro originally, and then six months afterwards, we, um, we did another interview with audio only, where we took individual photographs and we had him tell the story of the photograph. Okay. The only problem we had is between the first interview and the second interview, he had had um, teeth implants in. So his voice was different and he whistled. He whistled. So, so basically we had work to do in post-production audio to make the, the audio seem, seem yeah. And so basically the second interview was just him telling the story with his, with his, with his photographs. And then we, with each one of the artists, uh, each one of the experts, the scholars, we had them tell stories about these photographs. So the process was that the initial interview, the bones of the, of, of the film, and then bringing in these other, these other folks. One of the biggest obstacles for us, one of the hardest parts of, 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 of making this film, and the part that drives me nuts, is that doing the interviews and kind of figuring all that, you have control. But then you have to have the rights to every image there. The Frank Lloyd Wright Institute, they, they, they basically said, you can use any of the images you want. We had to buy footage, some of the motion picture footage, we had to buy it from other sources, so you have to, uh, you have to clear the rights and pay for the, for the rights. Um, the Nevelson Foundation was great, and then we had to deal with the Calder Foundation, and it was an absolute nightmare. Because even though Pedro had rights to his, the photographs that he did with Calder, they claimed secondary copyright. It's a weird, some obscure law that they passed in 1975, 1976. And not only do we have to get clear, clear the images, the old images, the archival images of Calder, but any footage that we shot in a public space, we had to get the right to use that. So we were in New York, we were in, 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 in a number of places, we shot images of Cal Calder's um, work, and we had to clear it with, with Calder. Foundation, and there was even work that was on the website for promotional purposes that was not in the film, and they were after us right up to the last minute, which means that you pay for the rights, you had to get somebody who was an expert in clearing rights, and you had to pay an attorney. We went over $20,000 or $30,000 at the very end, and this is after we paid already over $100,000 for rights um, to, clear the, to, clear, to clear those. It, it, was, it was driving us absolutely crazy right up to the, to the broadcast. Because the Calder Foundation, I don't want to bad mouth the Calder Foundation, but it's the reality of dealing with this kind of with artwork. When you're dealing with artwork, rights are a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And and, and, this, and this is a, this is a part of filmmaking that's no fun, but you have to deal with it. We had to clear every single image. And we had to clear them, not only this contractually we were bound for domestic use, but for educational, for theatrical and for international. And every time you clear it, every different level, the price goes up. So we spent probably $120,000 on rights uh, for, the, for, the, for the use of these images. And that's after the right folks gave them, let us use them for free. And better let us use them for free. So that's crazy stuff. If, if I might interject with your question, please. Um, do you cover all of this in your courses you teach here at Berkeley? No. <laughs> okay. No, we talk about it. We talk about it. So here at, at Berkeley, I, I do a, a series of, of, of Latino, a, a series of Latino films: 135A, 135B, and 135C, Chicano studies, under gender and ethnic studies. That that you and I developed. I mean, Alex and I developed the series. We we actually were behind it, and basically we talk. I'll talk about that in those courses. Mm -hmm. But what what is what goes on behind the scenes? But I'm also doing a 180 in ethnic studies, um, which is a workshop of about 10, 10 to 12 students in the fall where we do short films. And basically what I tell them is 
this is probably not going to you know, go in the air. You're not going to make any money. So use anything you want. Take anything you want and use it. YouTube, great. Magazines, great. So I'm basically going counter <laughs> to what I would do and basically say, use the images that work for you because you are not going to have to worry about it. So it's a, like a production class. It's a production class, but it's, it's, it's a production class where the students are free to use any, are free to use any images mm -hmm. they want. Whereas once you get into the world, into the world where somebody's going to make money, then everything the works. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. Two quick questions. I think you answered one of them already. Um, I'm wondering the footage that had Frank Lloyd Wright and Pedro um, in it during the American Masters. Did you get that from the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation? There, there were two, two or three photographs that 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 had Pedro and Frank Lloyd Wright in them, and those actually uh, Pedro had his Pedro has the rights to those, and his family has the rights to those images. There was a Japanese American photographer whose name I can't, can't remember. Um, but but uh, much of the, 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 the motion picture footage, a lot of that other footage, it belongs to the, to the foundation. And then the, the foundation, basically, in order to shoot a tally essay, we had to get the images. And then my other question was, how much of a hand did um, Frank Lloyd Wright have in Pedro's photographing of his architecture? And did he tell him where to stand and what to shoot? Or was it really up to him? Well, that's a really, really good question. Because Pedro was 22 years of age. And basically, he was raw dough for, for, <laughs> for, for, for Frank, Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright. And architects, uh, you know, they're, they're strong personalities. And I think, honestly, Frank Lloyd Wright molded Pedro. Pedro was a very, very um, courteous, charming person. And he ingratiated himself with Frank Lloyd Wright by telling him that his architecture was like sculpture. And that was like, you know, that was the thing that turned on Frank Lloyd Wright. Once he told him that, he said, come to me, my son. You know, that, kind of, <laughs> that kind of thing. Because, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was that's what, that, that's what a, an architect, the architect wanted to do. But I think, Frank Lloyd Wright was very instrumental in, 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 uh, in his career, not only in, in, in giving him the backing, but also showing him how to see. How, and, and I think that was, a, you know, he showed him how to see the, the work. And, and, and I, I, you know, I think some of it was, in, was instinct, but I think Frank Lloyd Wright really, really molded it. Hello. Uh, so just just of curiosity, so in the film, uh, it seems like all the photographs were produced uh, from the old style camera, and uh, I, I, I suppose that that kind of camera wasn't very common among people. But nowadays, since everyone has smartphone and then they can take photographs whenever they want, so I'm just wondering how how is this prevalence of the smartphone impacting the uh, photography set as an art? I can't. I mean, that's a little bit out of my league in terms of the how the smart smartphones impact it up. But I'll tell you, when, when, it, when you were going to shoot a photograph photograph on an eight by ten camera, and if, and if, you, if you check out the film, there's a sec section there which shows you how the big camera operates. You know, it's a big box, you know, a tripod, and then you set it up. You look through the back of it, you know, to the ground glass. And first of all, the image that you see is upside down, okay? And you also have to account for, in, in, with, a, with a big camera, you can account for the, the, the angle, okay? You have many things to consider before you take the photograph. The lighting, the composition, and everything. So you're very, very, you have to be very, very thoughtful before you shoot the, the, the image. And you may spend, Half hour, twenty minutes, hours, setting up the photograph and waiting for the light to be just right. Okay, and there's a couple of images. He tells a story about this one one photo that he shot called High Noon at Taliesin, where it's it's a bell tower at Taliesin West, where all the lines are perfectly aligned with with the walls and everything. Everything's perfectly aligned. It was just a, it was shot at the right moment. Mm -hmm. But that's not something to turn around and snap. So there's actually. A, a move toward back towards large format cameras that 
the other photographers are, 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 are now getting into because it's about process. It's really understanding the process and really appreciating your image. So people now can, like, with your phone, you can go and snap something very, very just like that, um, which I think is wonderful. But it's not the same kind of process that a photographer would use, like, like Pedro, when he was shooting these big buildings, because they have, you have to be very, very, very thoughtful. It's about contemplating, thinking, planning, that kind of thing. Um, with, he was also shooting with, the, uh, with, with some of the work that he did, the, the more documentary work that he did with, with, with uh, Calder and kind of behind the scenes stuff. He would do either a two by two format Hasselblad, which gave him a little more, a little more latitude to move around quite a bit. But these big old cameras, some of them are, I guess, what, eight by ten cents, five by seven. They're big old heavy cameras. And you saw that camera that he was assembling at the beginning of the whole different film. So I'm sorry I can't really answer your question, but it's it's a very different way of approaching a photograph than to just figuring it out and thinking about it. Okay, uh, okay, one more question. You talked about how he used photography to tell the story of Wright and Caldwell and Neville. Did he ever use photography to tell his own story? Um, yes and no. First of all, he does. If you, you, you will notice that you see several images of, of him in there, of, of, him, of him posing. And I asked his wife, I said, well, you know, what, why? I, I, I think we were really lucky that we had the images. And um, she basically said he was always very concerned about develop, developing an image of himself. He was concerned with his image. So he, at a very young age, way back when, was kind of a pioneer of the selfie. Mm -hmm. he, took, he took photographs of himself and he used them. We're really, really, really lucky on that. They look like he's posing. Oh, he's posing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's posing. And so he was developing an image. And he was a great storyteller, but he didn't tell stories, a lot of stories uh, about himself. So he, had a, he was a man with a big ego, great storyteller, but he was a bit modest about telling stories of, uh, about himself. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to get into the intimate details of his life, of his early life, yes, but later on, no. So, I hope that answers. Thank you very much. Please join me uh, in thanking Ray Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Alex.